Okay, I think we are now live. Hello everyone and welcome to today's ASCE webinar, Emerging Insights on Navigating Remote Labs. My name is Alex Sharp and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We appreciate your feedback during the webinar. You can let us know how we're doing by sending a message in the chat pod. After the webinar ends, please check your email within two business days for our brief feedback survey, along with access links to the webinar slides and recording. If you have questions during the webinar, feel free to enter them in the Q&A pod at any time. That pod is located right below the chat pod, and we will have time dedicated to Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we do have two upcoming webinars highlighting emerging insights on remote teaching and learning and you can register from the links on this slide, and full details are available at ASDE.org slash webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our three facilitators. Margot Vigen is a professor of chemical engineering at Bucknell University. Margot's broad research area is effective engineering pedagogy, including active problem, project, and product-based learning, focusing on inquiry-based learning to improve conceptual understanding in thermodynamics. She's also interested in the ways that student creativity, particularly in maker spaces, can be used to support active and entrepreneurially minded learning in technical courses. Margot works to support broad adoption of these effective learning approaches through workshops. She teaches chemical engineering, thermodynamics, applied food science and engineering, and capstone design. She is a fellow of the American Society for Engineering Education, an Apple Distinguished Educator, and chair of the 2022 ASCE AICG Chemical Engineering Summer School. Anne Marie Thomas directs the Playful Learning Lab at the University of St. Thomas. She is a professor in the School of Engineering, the Opus College of Business, and the Center for Engineering Education. She is the creator of Squishy Circuits and the author of Making Makers, Kids, Tools, and the Future of Innovation. The Playful Learning Lab is currently in a multi-year residency at the Minnesota Children's Museum, working on playful family interactions and a partnership with Metro Deaf School and the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf, developing art and technology programming for deaf and hard of hearing children. Anne Marie served as the founding executive director for the Maker Education Initiative. Dr. Julian Yamaura is a teaching professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Washington. He teaches courses related to construction materials, design and construction of temporary structures, and infrastructure construction means and methods. Prior to joining the UW, Julian has worked for Pavia Systems, Inc. as an engineering consultant assisting with the development and deployment of a construction project inspection technology for public organizations and construction engineering and inspection firms across the country. He has also worked for the Atkinson Construction as a construction engineer working on large transportation infrastructure projects in Washington State. Julian's research focuses on mobile technology systems in construction and their impact on project management. Other interests include heavy civil construction and pavements. Yes, we are getting to the content right now. Without further Hello, ado, I will let Margo take coming. it away. I'd like to start with a kind of 20,000 foot overview of how we might think about converting engineering labs for remote instruction. And I want us to start with the end in mind. That is, what is lab for? And I'm gonna give you a quiz on this in just a second after I've had a chance to show you your possible options. So in a terrific uh, paper in Journal of Engineering Education in 2005, Faisal and Rosa put forth 13 uh, canonical objectives for engineering lab. And so uh, you're gonna get a quiz right now popping up that invites you to look at these objectives with me and consider what are the ones that are most important for your labs. So I'm allowed to talk even though I can't uh, move slides as we're doing this. Please go ahead and select all that apply and think about, you may reflect on you know, an entire course level or one particular lab if that helps you think about it uh, more clearly. So I'm happy to see we have a variety of things being selected. Uh, we, in general, agree that all of these are important in laboratories in, at some level, but we're seeing a few of them be uh, most important. So we're ready to uh, move on because we're looking at theory and practice, experimental design, data analysis, communication, and teamwork. And uh, as I've seen these before, that those are, I believe, 
the most popular lab outcome. So let's think about those outcomes through the lens of what we can still do if we're working remotely. Um, I hope you'll agree with me. I took two of these off the table as pretty difficult to do uh, remotely, psychomotor skills and sensory awareness. And then I took another two partially off the table about assembling your designs, for example. But we still have the vast majority of what we want out of lab available, including all of the ones that you all just selected as the most important. So what's our framework? What I propose is we work like this. Oh, and also I highlight this one because uh, as you, uh, as I just saw in your results, this one was selected the most often. And also it's one I'm gonna focus on um, going forward in this little part of the talk. So what I am recommending that we use as our approach for lab changeover is to reflect upon what objectives are the most critical. Maybe we used to hit all 13 of those. Now we're gonna hit a subset. What of those do we really need to keep? And then let's design towards those goals in particular. So for example, I saw lots of folks saying data, uh, <laughs> data analysis was critical. We can still do data analysis. Have the students write their pre-lab, then provide them with some data on which they do, their curve fitting, their statistics, uh, their model regression, and so on, and then have, the, um, have them write it up as normal. If communication is the big outcome and they were supposed to do presentations, you can ask the students instead to provide a video presentation that maybe they have recorded with a computer or even a phone. We are hearing from employers of our most recent graduates that teamwork via things like Zoom and Slack is ever more critical for the graduates. So this is in fact a really good opportunity for us to encourage teamwork among students remotely. Uh, in fact, I've heard a bunch of people talk about how they're gonna work that in even if we're face to face. Now we come to my favorite typo, which is where I put in video report twice. What I meant to have here is thinking about equipment selection. If you had the students selecting instrumentation as part of your outcomes, there's no reason that has to go away. In fact, they can do a nice in-depth critical thinking report where they can imagine they have an unlimited budget or a limited one and go to different manufacturers' websites and present you with the case for what it is they'd like to do their measurements with. Finally, we can emphasize conceptual learning in our battle between theory and practice, and we can do that remotely. And that's uh, the example I want to take us in depth on here. So in my own research on engineering education, we looked at conceptual learning in thermodynamics and heat transfer, and we used as our uh, basis for that the work of laws on inquiry-based learning. And this is something that works particularly well for students with misconceptions. So that is when they think the world operates one way and you got to change their mind about it by showing them that it actually operates a different way. And how this approach works briefly is you have the students make a prediction that elicits their misconception. Then there is an experiment, and I'll talk about what I mean by experiment in a moment, that generates a teachable moment that shows them where their conception is different than truth, and then a reflection to consolidate learning to really turn that surprise at the teachable moment into something real. So let's, let's all try this. Let's do this together. Here we have a fantastic elaborate laboratory setup where we have two cups of water. In one of them, hard to see, but it's really there, there's 25 grams of chipped ice, whereas in the other, there is a 25 gram ice cube. Both of these are 100 mils of water that started at room temperature. And the prediction question I would ask my students, and that um, I'm asking all of you right now in a moment, is which of these two systems cools more rapidly, um, if one of them does in fact cool more rapidly, and which of these cools to a lower temperature, if one of them cools to a lower temperature. So let's pull those two questions up right now and give everyone a chance to uh, make a prediction. And I do like and appreciate the answers I'm seeing. Um, we're seeing stuff very similar to what the uh, students give us, which is, in general, they get the first question right. Um, and 
since you all are instructors and know a lot about the world, you're getting the second question right too, but um, not quite as overwhelmingly as the first question. So thank you. Let's, let's close that for a second. And I'm gonna show you some data, all right? So we have thought about this. Let's see what the data shows us. In this graph, the red line or the line that drops most steeply is what's happening with the chipped ice. And the green line, or the one that cools slowly, is what's happening with the ice cube. And you can see that your prediction was in fact correct. Chipped ice cools the water much more rapidly. And in fact, students get this right. But um, a surprising fraction of students in engineering heat transfer courses also then say that the chipped ice will cool the water more. They believe perhaps in some kind of thermal inertia that sends it off the bottom. But you can see from the results, they both end up at the same final temperature. So that was talking about an experiment, but with my colleagues, Mike Prince, Catherine Nottis, and Milo Koretsky, we tested that as an experiment against five modalities of possible implementation. And it's the ones besides experiment that have the most relevance for us right now. So in every case, there was a prediction and a reflection, and we captured the student's change over the entire course of the course with a concept inventory at the beginning of the semester and at the end. But in the middle, students maybe did an experiment, they watched a demo, they did a simulation, or they watched a demo of a simulation, or they did what we just did right now, which we call thought experiment. No experiment actually involved, we just look at things together and talk about it. And so here's an example of what the simulation looks like for that same experiment. I'll note we switched to orange soda because showing it as water made it completely invisible on the screen. I'm about to hit you with a mass quantity of data for which I apologize, but we're trying to be efficient here. Here are our results over several years and oh dear, the headers are gone, Alex. This is not great. Well, I'll tell you what the headers say and I apologize for this Profusely, this is not what it looked like before. You may I try clicking one. They might be a sort of a, a activity thing. Hmm, yep. wait. Oh, okay. No, nope. that's all right. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know how that happened. Let me draw a picture in your mind, my friends. So what we have in these columns are pre, that's the beginning of class, and post at the end of class for two different conceptual areas. What we have coming from the top down is in red, no intervention at all, just the class. And you see students do about five percentage points better. In green is what happens when the students do the experiments. And you can see that is quite a lot better. It's a much more significant jump, maybe up to uh, 40 points or so. Then what I have circled in green is what the change is like for the things that we can do remotely. We can, uh, so it's showing thought experiment, it's showing demo, it's showing simulation. And what you see here is, yeah, it's not as great as when they did the experiment, but it is in every case significantly better than doing nothing. We can still achieve a lot of our most important outcomes even when we don't have access to the experiment when we are creative about how we do it. Um, I personally believe uh, these data suggest that the secret sauce is the prediction and the reflection. Um, having to sit down and talk through something does quite a lot of the work for us that we can fill in just about any other way. Oh, if you want to use this for your heat transfer class, all these materials are available through the AICHE Concept Warehouse. I will put the link in the chat after I'm done talking. So in summary, I think uh, we have, yes, we love lab and it's really important, but we can do almost everything we used to do in lab by focusing on our objectives and being creative about ways to meet them given the affordances we have right now. We can emphasize concepts, we can hand out data, we can provide simulations or video, and we can keep teamwork and communication. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm gonna be around to answer questions. Thanks so much, Margo, and I promise that those slides that we send via email will include the header text from that chart. I don't know what happened there. Um, if anyone has questions for Margo, feel free to put them in the chat, uh, the Q&A pod, excuse me, and we'll get to those at the end of the webinar. 
And we're going to turn it over now to Anne Marie Thomas. Hi, all. All right. So, um, following on Margot, I love following Margot because she said a lot of the things that I would have said, so I can go in a little bit of a different direction here. Um, I, I think I love that ASC framed this as remote labs, not virtual labs. I keep hearing a lot of people calling them virtual labs, and they're not virtual if we're doing this, right? So, so we are doing it. This is still a lab experience, but we're doing it remotely. And I think one of the big framings that's been important has been to look at what we did this past school year as one thing. It was emergency triage. But what we're doing going forward being very different because we now have warning and as engineers now we know some of the some of the things we need to plan for. And I think we have to really up our game going forward. Um, one of the advantages I have, I, I am a professor of mechanical engineering in our school of engineering and a professor of entrepreneurship in our school of business. But the thing that has helped me the most for teaching online is that for the last 10 years, I've been teaching um, in our engineering education program for K-12 teachers, which is heavily online. So we've been figuring out how to teach engineering online with hands-on materials, including the fact that in those classes, all of my students aren't undergrads or graduate engineering students, they're in-service teachers. And here, for many of us, if you're in the US watching this, our K-12 teachers have a lot of training on pedagogy, child development, assessment, rubrics, and so I've always found I had to up my game when teaching teachers, um, which prepared me in ways I really didn't expect uh, and now appreciate heavily going into these labs. So what are the questions? Well, starting anything here when I go into my teaching, um, and from an engineering standpoint, I tend to teach design classes. So I saw in the chat someone discussing, well, what about the hands-on stuff? Um, I tend to teach projects where students are given design challenges and have to build things, usually mechanical, sometimes electromechanical, in group, typically working together, problem solving. Um, and so going into a class like that, if I can't have them in the room anymore working together, we have to really do a lot of rethinking. Uh, how, do we get, how, do we, how do we get students to have that hands-on collaborative experience? So the first thing I want to start with is the what are the questions. Um, similar to what Margot asked, there are some core specific things. I, looking at the chat here, I see a lot of people are asking, like, how does this work for electrical engineering? I've been in a lot of these calls. How does it work for computer? How does it work for civil? Uh, but there are some universal truths I think we all have to ask. And so I'm going to focus more on the universal concepts and less on the specifics. That said, I would happy in Q&A or later chat with anybody if they want to reach out and talk specifics of I teach a freshman level engineering design and graphics course that involves CAD, that involves some hands-on skills. We can go into those, those details later. But for now, let's look at the specifics. Well, some of the questions that I use when setting up a course are what are the experiences and learnings that are core to this course? Um, similar to Margot's, and we can back this up with the research. But then once you've written that list, let's really question your assumptions. Um, I suspect none of us in our training took our lab remotely. Um, right? This, this feels new. Um, and so some of the things that we've taken for granted, maybe we have to question them. Like, do we really have to have every project be a group project in that course? Or do we really have to have the students run that specific experiment themselves? Um, what are the key elements of the classroom lab experience that you want to bring to your online experience? For many of us, labs involve teamwork, right? They usually, they often aren't, they're working with a lab partner. They often aren't people working with, by themselves in isolation. Um, so really thinking through not just the content, but also the experiential things that you want them to, to still have in your remote lab. And then the last part is really, what do I need my students to experience doing for themselves versus watching? Um, for our emergency triage engineering labs this spring of 2020, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of putting experiments online. My own university has done that, where faculty have still gone into the labs, video the experiment, and had the students analyze the data um, and watch the experiment. For triage, that's great. Uh, but now if we move forward and we're trying to figure out how, how we do this in a world where we might, be, we might be remote more often, I think we have to really think through this last question of what do we need what do we really feel it's essential that our students do themselves? And which can, are we OK if they do them versus watching? Um, so I, again, if I go back to our engineering education for teachers class, I want to just have a shout out here to our university, the University of St. Thomas, our chair of civil engineering, who is also our chair of engineering education, Deb Besser. And March 18th, before we even saw classes being moved virtually for everybody, she had already gone in to the building um, and packed up boxes for all of her students. 
and mailed off materials so that her students could have boxes of materials that they could then use uh, to do some experiments at home. And that's what I just chose to focus on for this call today is what are, what are our options in terms of mailing things to students? Because we cannot take as a baseline that students have a lot of things at home. Um, if you are like me, your students come from a variety of backgrounds, and there isn't a universal what they have at home. So I'm showing a picture here is I'm, I'm living remote labs um, right this moment because the research lab I run is running an eight-week STEM camp for 80 deaf children, um, and we are actually mailing out boxes and delivering boxes every week. And I'm learning a lot of lessons through this um, because when we want to send things to students, there's some logistics here. And I am a huge, huge believer in doing things hands-on. And to do things hands-on, we need to get materials to students. So I just wanted to, to dive into logistics a little bit. If you're considering doing some remote, hands-on learning in the fall that involves packages. Um, I will say for my freshman engineering design courses, um, I'll be teaching five of those this fall, um, in addition to a graduate engineering education class. And for those, I am planning on doing remote mailing. So some lessons that I've learned through both our summer camp from many years of our engineering education classes remotely are there are some things you might want to keep in mind as you start thinking about the possibility of mailing materials to your students. One is if you want to send materials to students to do some of the work at home, I highly recommend this. And I also honestly love the idea of sending these things from the school. You can also give them shopping lists. But here are some of the lessons to think about. Um, one that I didn't put here is cost. Think through cost. Um, I, I'm advising a physics department um, elsewhere on kits that they're going to send to students. And given the financial situation that we are seeing globally right now, asking students to buy a bunch of materials in addition to an expensive textbook uh, could be a huge burden for this coming fall. Could you replace that textbook with the materials? So a warning I would give you, speaking as someone who is running, um, we will be sending over 800 boxes in the next three weeks. Purchasing is slow right now. You're not the only person pivoting to an online lab with mailed boxes. The second is weight affects your costs greatly. You probably know that. Learn the laws about shipping things. This is a shout out to my EE friends. Um, and I also took a year off from my faculty position to run the Maker Education Initiative nonprofit where we were training a lot of hands-on projects in electronics remotely. Um, you probably know this, but, but lithium batteries, even those coin cells, you have a lot of restrictions. So think about the weight, think about ordering now, and think about all the legality of mailing things. I see someone mentioning about box dimensions. Yes, that affects it greatly as well. And packing is tedious, you need a plan. Um, it, it typically takes, right now we are sending out 82 individual boxes each week for an eight-week program that I wish I had planned in advance, but honestly we can't do it in advance because this all happens so fast, especially I'm in the Twin Cities and in the top of COVID, you've, you've seen uh, some of the outcomes of the riots that we've had here. So we have a lot of kids who will be doing engineering projects remotely. So I can get materials into their hands, and maybe they're cheaper materials than I've used in the past, but I still can have them building something. What are some of the other things that you'll want to think about, particularly if you're doing collaborative design classes, which again is sort of my focus in teaching? One is group work. Um, I'm at a university that hopes to have our freshman engineering design classes back on campus in the fall, but they'll be in masks and they'll be socially distanced. That makes group work very hard. Um, talking through a mask becomes very difficult, and if you or your students like I have auditory issues, it's very difficult to have meaningful conversations. So real, finding ways to allow your students to have authentic group discussions in a way that they feel safe and they can share things is important. Um, if our school has been using Zoom. We use a lot of putting our groups in Zoom breakout rooms to have students discuss the results or the design projects that they're doing. And that's something we hope to continue in the fall. Complicated parts. So I suspect um, from seeing the chat and some of the rumbles about things earlier in this chat, I suspect that there's some people saying, well, that's nice if you're going to use Lego, and that's nice if you're going to use toothpicks. But what about the complicated part? So this becomes a challenge. But again, it's only June. We're engineers. For many of us, we've got another two to three months to plan this. Uh, speaking as a machine design professor, are there ways that you can have some people on campus still machining? be it staff, be it students that maybe you've hired and trained in as teaching assistants, so that we still can have, for example, machine design, the experience of students having their parts machined uh, from a model. Another one to consider, uh, speaking of someone who teaches a lot of CAD, is computers. Um, 
we had to pivot all of our SOLIDWORKS training that I, that I do for our students. How do we pivot that to virtual? Um, we're using Amazon Web Services to allow our students to still get into SOLIDWORKS, um, but that, that is challenging. Um, and that is something you want to have a plan for if there's a computer element of your labs and you're doing them in real time. Um, and again, I know I'm going through lots of topics, and I'm happy to chat with people later in Q&A or one-on-one or -on -one, um, offline um, after this, this session. Um, even if your lab moves back into person, for those of us who teach software, and I saw it flash, flap by in the chat, someone talking about, well, how do you debug if you're eight feet apart? Similarly, how do I teach a student who's struggling with SOLIDWORKS if I am eight feet apart from them? Right? So you'll want to think through, how are we coaching? How are we coaching? In, method, in methods, even if a student is doing the experiment in their own house, how do you give them the best feedback for that? So again, what are the questions you want to ask, right? What are the things that, the student, that you want the students still to be able to do? Um, question those, and probably I would highly recommend, and this is something I've been doing heavily, is find someone at a different school than yours who teaches a similar class and run your assumptions by them. Because again, we are, we are kind of creatures of the training that we have had, um, and we're trying to replicate things exactly the same way we did in person, but remote isn't going to look the same way. Um, and see if there are ways that you can, you can rethink what it is that you've been doing. Now, I know a question that came up, um, and I saw, it, I saw it posted already, was the, do you expect people to mail stuff back? There are multiple ways to do this, and there's historic precedent for both of you. For us, in our graduate engineering education program for teachers, we do mail out equipment, circuit boards. We mail out um, different components for, for fluids experiments. We have it built in to have those mailed back. That is part of the course, as you return your box of materials so that we can prep them for the next batch of students taking that course. So investing in higher quality equipment that you can send out and have returned is an option. And can that become your textbook? Is it possible to offset costs instead of the $150 textbook you're having your students buy this year? Could you have them buy or rent your lab kit and have it returned? Um, one of the things I've been stressing in all the discussions I've had about teaching remotely, though, is context. Um, regardless of whether you go back in person in the fall or whether you are doing everything remotely in the fall, um, we talk a lot about the content and we talk a lot about the group work, but I think we all really can't forget this context is that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and financial duress. Um, our that is something that is weighing on our students. And even if you could perfectly replicate what you've done in a classroom, your students are juggling a lot more now as they're doing this remotely. So if you are planning on doing group work, again, as someone who does a lot of group design projects, Having backup plans for what happens when the partners on those labs disappear, or if they take a pause, if someone gets sick. Um, a lot of schools are having backup plans for instructors. That's something you probably want to build in for lab partners as well, um, because this, this is going to affect and limit what we can do in the fall. Um, we, we need our students to feel safe and connected for them to do their best work. Um, and so I think while we're thinking about the logistical and technical issues, we also have to think about the stress that so many of our students are undergoing right now. Um, and that is the end of my time, so I would love to pass on to Julian. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Julian, please feel free to take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, let me, there we go. So um, I wanted to say thanks for joining in. There's a lot of different aspects, I think, of engineering that's being covered here. And what I wanted to show you real quick was what we went through in my class. So I'm going to, I just want to give you an idea of what an in-person class feels like uh, in my labs. Uh, and then I just want to talk a little bit about just the impacts of COVID and what we decided to do as, as the instructional team uh, and how we wanted to deliver lab content a little bit differently than we normally would. Um, and then I just, you know, compiled a, a little bit of some recommendations to share with you guys all at the end there. So let me start off by describing what our lab feels like. So I teach a class called CEE 337. That's a construction materials class. Uh, there's about two hours of lectures twice a week. And then the most fun part, I would say, is for the students to join in on this two-hour lab session. And we do that once a week. Uh, and when I was you know, 
I think Anne Marie's comment was really nice to where I, I've got networks of people teaching at different universities. So we, you know, we huddled up and we said, hey, how are you teaching your class this year uh, or this quarter, right, with the COVID situation? So half of them were like, you know, my class is actually not really a graduation requirement. Uh, we might be able to postpone it. So actually some of them ended up canceling this type of course. Um, for our department, this was one of the graduation requirements um, that it's not very offered uh, very many times in the year. So I didn't feel right just to kind of cancel it. So this was just a little bit of a background on what we're dealing with. Um, and it always starts, we have a 24 person classroom just like this here. Uh, this is my TA, Milad. Um, but you know, about quarter to half of the uh, session for the labs start off in, in this classroom setting, uh, making sure everybody kind of understands what they need to do for the day. Uh, and then they get released into the fun part of the lab. And a lot of the, you know, labs are kind of a very repetitive in sense that, you know, we deal with five types of construction materials. So concrete, asphalt, different types of metals and wood. And what the students love the most is this hands-on experience part of it. Just like I think you guys all would agree with, when you have hands-on experience, there's something that clicks with the students. Things that you teach in the lectures start, you know, clicking in their minds. So, you know, what they do is they go out there, they go make their own concrete. Uh, you know, they let it cure and everything. And there's a lot of pride in that. And then once that concrete is ready, right, they get to test it. And a lot of times it's a destructive type of testing. Uh, and then they get, gather data. Right? Um, and then they can typically write a lab report. So they make something and they break something and then they get to write about it. Um, and this really is, I think, one of the few classes that we have in our department uh, where students get that hands-on experience. So it was really important trying to figure out how we could, as much as possible, uh, translate this into more of a remote session. So some of the things that happened, as you guys are all aware, uh, the impact of COVID was that all of our lectures and lab content went online, fully online. Some faculty were ready because maybe they taught online classes before. Uh, some had very few weeks to flip their classes into more of a remote setting. Uh, but you know, I, I huddled up. We have a lab instructor uh, with myself, who's an instructor, and then a couple TAs. Uh, there's about 74 people that take this every quarter. Um, and we, we sat down together and we said, you know, this is, let's take this as an opportunity to kind of look at certain things and how we can reshift things. Um, and ultimately what we decided is, is you know, we, we talked to some of our colleagues that sent out field kit kits. Um, you know, just, it's a tremendous amount of weight trying to make just a few samples of concrete. Uh, it might work with maybe our metals, but, you know, so I, I like that idea. Uh, but not everybody has a testing equipment in their garage either. So that one quickly went out the door for us. And, you know, the next best thing is to kind of think about what our students are going to be doing. And majority of our students uh, end up going into the industry. We have a few that stay back and do, you know, grad schools and things like that. But one of the main things that we thought of again is when they go out there as a construction engineer, civil engineer, you know, the main parts of their job might not actually, very few of them are going to go out and work for a concrete, you know, mixed producer. A lot of them are going to be managing or engineering projects. And one of the big things that we really thought of, we took this time is saying, you know what, let's work on their supervisory type of skills, their management skills. Can they see things that are going on uh, and correct it? And then how would they react? And then ultimately, would they know how some of those errors uh, you know, taking a step back, what are the bigger picture ideas of, you know, catching some of these mistakes? So we basically went on from like this left hand picture of the hands on experience. Um, and then our new idea was that, you know what, I think it's okay that we're not going to let them get that hands on experience right now in this quarter, but rather why don't we as instructors go out in the lab, film us doing it the right way and then even doing it the wrong way and then seeing if they can, you know, kind of catch all these errors and then most importantly figure out the bigger, uh, uh, you know, the bigger ideas of how these errors are going to impact their structures that they're designing or building. So we ended up taking two approach here. Uh, we wanted to do a hybrid course. Um, and one of the big reasons is it's great to be able to do asynchronous type of activities where you're pre-recording uh, videos and things like that. Get them prepared. Uh, and that's a great use, I think, uh, of that kind of a teaching method. 
But we also wanted a synchronous version too, where we were teaching in real time, um, and it does something. It, it, I feel like it's, it promotes a sense of community. They're already in isolation, right? And uh, I just wanted them to be able to kind of log in and have that sense of community that they would normally feel. Um, and that's why it was so important for our team to you know, go synchronous as well. So it's a combination of the two. We did a bunch of pre-recorded videos, and, and I'll talk more about the actual means and methods of how we did that, some of those. Um, and then you know that, and then every two hours or every Thursdays for two hours, we did a synchronous activity where we met up on Zoom, and we you know they already watched these videos, so now we can actually talk a little bit more about the critical thinking and active learning components of it. So it actually freed up more time uh, for really you know thoughtful and meaningful discussion. Now, let me talk a little bit about the asynchronous approach that we took here. Um, we pre-recorded some lab videos, or lab modules as we called it, um, and you know, I'm a big fan of essentially just keeping these videos short. You know, a lot of our students, including me, myself, attention span is very low. So if you end up giving him, the you know, first thing I look at is how long is this thing going to take me to watch? You know, and if you give them an hour and a half to two hour videos, right off the bat, you can expect them to fast forward or watch it, you know, two or three times the speed. So it was really important to kind of give him these bite-sized chunks, snippets of these clips. Um, and one of the big things I wanted to share with you, because I get asked by faculty all the time about this, is what did you use? What kind of equipment did you have to invest in? And my answer to them was actually, you got to keep it simple, especially if you only have several weeks or several days to react to something like COVID. Uh, you can't be going out there and buying you know, expensive equipment and learning how to uh, edit videos and things like that. So uh, I already had a couple of these GoPros. Uh, so I decided, you know what? I need to be able to move around the lab and still be able to take good videos and photos. Uh, no need for fancy gimbals or any type of stabilization equipment. So nowadays you can get an action camera like GoPros for pretty cheap. Um, so that was definitely an important tool that I used. And then some kind of a you know, selfie stick or a tripod uh, lets you basically handle that camera a lot more efficiently. Now the more important part, as instructors and as a faculty, I highly believe that you should not just record a video without editing it and then putting it out there on your learning management system. Uh, I've tried that method before when we had very small time to prepare and it turns out the students don't really watch it. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and you just search for anything that you want to learn, a lot of times right there edited, there's the intro and things like that. So um, it's actually really important that you put some time to edit some of these videos. Um, now with that said, I don't I don't recommend everybody to go uh, download or buy some of these fancy video equipment or the editor equipment. A lot of you, if you own a Windows computer, you already have a really nice uh, and easy to use tool. So what I ended up using was the photo app. You know, if you go down there and just type in photo on your search bar on the bottom uh, left hand corner, you'll get it if you're using a window. And I'm sure there's something very similar for uh, uh, Apple or Mac computers as well. So stay simple there and I'm going to have a demo that I'll show you in just a minute on uh, how I used MS Photo and the footages that I got from the action camera and you know in, in a matter of hours uh, you can really edit some of these videos and make it really presentable and digestible. Um, and then I, I get asked this a lot too but this is more I guess dependent on your university or where you teach at right? How do you disseminate this stuff? Uh, our, we use Canvas Learning Management uh, System and you know there's really about two gigs of limit on uh, how much data we could put on there. So uh, whatever you can do, like Google, uh, shared Google Drive, Dropbox, whatever your you know, choice of file sharing is, that works great. Um, and then you can always link that to Canvas too. So um, we ended up just putting all of our videos outside of our uh, typical learning management. Now we'll just wait till that presentation gets back online here, but uh, I spent maybe about five to ten minutes just putting those little title cards and things like that. And again, that was just use of MS Photos, right? I think a lot of us think that editing videos is this really hard thing where you have to spend hours learning. Um, and you know, the one that I'm recommending, it really doesn't take much learning, um, and it's really easy. I had no video editing experience before this too, so. Um, and you know, I asked the students how important that was just having these videos and a lot of them did mention how some of these editing and putting text, embedding them on top, uh, you know, little things like that really go a long way. 
Um, now let me show you what we did for the synchronous approach. Now for this one, um, you know, there's three sections of it. And, you know, somebody just asked me a question, and I'm going to actually address that now. And there are times where the students don't watch the videos, right? I'm actually expecting a few of them that don't. Uh, you just always have students that aren't, you know, preparing. Um, and when they come to lab, so the synchronous part, uh, portion was, um, was really helpful in really understanding what the students kind of got from the videos and whatnot. And what I ended up doing in these sessions, um, now we use Zoom to have like the you know, communal, communal class meeting in these live stream sessions. So what we would do is, you know, assuming that they watch the videos, I would actually show one more video in these live, live stream sessions. Um, except for this time, I thought about all the things that I've seen done incorrectly out in the field on my projects I've worked on. Uh, and then I basically reenacted it. And then I would have the students watch that in real time. And then we would go out into those uh, breakout rooms. And then we would uh, you know, essentially talk about all the different things that they caught, uh, which is the easy part. But the harder part is to think about, OK, now that you've caught all those things, what are the bigger implications of you know, finding uh, these types of errors in procedures? So again, it was more of a way uh, for the students to start getting engaged in how to think about you know, these experimental designs uh, and things like that. So, I really think that the combination or the hybrid of these two really kind of, uh, you know, brought the sense, right? They got the feel what the lab looked like. Uh, they got the spacious part of it. They got all the, you know, where the equipment and all that were. Uh, but then the synchronous part also kind of got you connected to the instructional team too. So uh, for this one, um, all, you know, all we used was smartphones and also my laptop camera. Uh, what was really cool about the synchronous approach too is we live, we did some experiments live. And rather than just giving our students a table full of data, um, we, we set up phone cameras. So we set up cell phones all over the place in front of the dial readings and, all, and um, uh, other types of areas. And what we ended up doing is shining spotlights at some of these uh, important cameras. And then students will actually you know, take the measurements in real time with us. So uh, again, it's not just giving them a table, but it was really bringing that classroom experience to their home and just having several, you know, smartphones, placing them all over the place, um, and then you know, broadcasting on Zoom. I, I think it really made a big difference. Um, almost, it was almost like being there in the lab. Um, so I just want to wrap it up with just a few recommendations. Uh, you know, it, this might not be the best model for every class or every lab out there, right? So you guys are the experts. You know what's best out there. Um, but you know, there's three ways of doing it. Is it all live? Is it all pre-recorded so they can do things on their own time, which has their benefits? Or is it a hybrid? Uh, you know, and, and go with one of those. Uh, I'm a big fan of just preparing these short length. Uh, keep it under 10 minutes if you can. Um, and again, it's just a lot easier for them to keep their attention on those single videos. Uh, Another one, modern action videos, you, or cameras rather. You don't have to spend a lot of money. For a couple hundred dollars at most, you can go get these action cameras, and they're ver very versatile. If you're out in the field doing lots of field labs, um, you can capture a lot of really good content without needing stabilizers or gimbals or things like that. It's very low maintenance. Um, and then lastly, um, editing videos is probably the most sig significantly important or impacted student views. Um, and information retention. So I really do suggest you guys maybe taking a look at you know MS uh, photos or some other real basic uh, video editing tools and try to make it a little bit more digestible than maybe some raw video footages because um, that will make a big difference. Uh, all right, thanks everybody. I'll flip it over to Alex. Thanks, Julian, and thank you to our other presenters as well. So now we have time for some questions. Um, the first question I'd like to ask is, I think that probably all of you can answer this. For hands-on work done remotely, how are folks attending to student safety and institutional liability concerns? And that's from Ken. Go ahead, Emory. I think that's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, none of, none of the labs that I have been involved with have serious uh, safety considerations. Uh, so if you, I, I could imagine if you were doing something a bit more chemical engineering, um, that could be an issue. Um, so I can't speak to that. I suspect that that is something that that's actually on a list I know that we are talking about uh, for my lab for the summer. So I hopefully in a couple of weeks I might have an answer. 
Um, but I suspect that I have an easier time of it, given that we're a freshman design class for the most part, than many of you. I could, uh, I can talk a little bit about that too. So that has been a big, I think, concern for our labs, especially construction or engin uh, civil engineering related, because it's just really hard to work six feet away or you know whatever that distance is in your local municipality. So one of the big things that I've done is if you take a look out in your communities, uh, construction, at least here in Seattle, it, it's, it's going on. Uh, and there's a huge amount of precautions that go with that. So I guess part of the, the benefit of just being tied to the industry so much is I got some of my friends um, that are project engineers and they sent me their safety protocols. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's at least 30 pages. And every construction company I've reached out to that was happy to share information, it's about 30 pages of, you know, uh, safety document. Now, construction always has a big, uh, you know, package like that anyways. Um, but I highly recommend maybe looking at something like that and seeing how construction industry is dealing with that. Because if you really think about it, your, your labs might not be that different, right? Uh, you have students that are working in very small uh, proximity that needs to work together. Um, and I think looking at some of those safety aspects in construction is, is, it was helpful to us. Uh, it also is eye-opening the amount of things you really need to think about uh, in keeping your students safe. So uh, that's, I guess that's my advice. Uh, and I don't know how to share it, but I'm more than happy to redact and share some of that information with all of you too, if that's needed. Thanks, Julian and Anne-Marie. Um, I have a question from earlier that Margot answered, but I would, but I would love for her to share uh, a response with the full group. Uh, and the question was from Richard. Do you have comparative data on student learning outcomes for in-lab and online um, approaches? Yes, and uh, so such data exists. And uh, one paper I will point to is from uh, Milo Koretsky and his group, where he has a entire, not just one of these little simulations, but in fact a, a detailed lab experience in uh, vapor deposition for making chips. And uh, he has documented extensively the ways that this is, uh, in some cases, much better than a hands-on experience because, for example, it gets around some safety and expense concerns that you would have if the students were doing this for real um, and allows the students to focus more closely on concepts. Um, uh, our work looks at this a little bit, although not explicitly in online, but it does compare the simulations to uh, nothing and to the physical practice. Um, and I can, um, I can email some of these citations out if you like. Great. Thanks so much, Margo. Uh, we have a question from Jan for Anne-Marie. And uh, Anne Marie Jam would like to hear more specifics on your plans for the engineering graphics course this fall, and so would I. So would I, actually. So the, the timing of all of this is sort of interesting. I have been a professor at St. Thomas for 14 years now, and I have taught that class about 37 times. And this spring was actually the last time our combined full engineering graphics class was taught. And as luck would have it, this fall, we're completing doing two separate classes, one in engineering design for all engineering students, and then a, we do four credit classes. So a two credit there, and a two credit engineering graphics course. Um, so the wrong semester to sign up probably to do six classes instead of the usual three for the fall, and also to teach a brand new class. So our goal for the graphic side of things is very um, CAD and drafting focused, but I always put in the design element. We will be using SolidWorks, but students will be using SolidWorks online. Now, there is a twist here um, that I think I can say, which is we are opening in the fall at St. Thomas. And in a school of engineering, the hope among the administration is that our freshman level classes are in person. So for the engineering graphics course, developing a new class, um, I am working with my teaching assistants who are undergrads. And we are, I am assuming that I should prepare everything to be done completely online, but that I will hopefully be doing it in person, but quick to switch on that. So that, I, I put that there because it is affecting how I, I, um, how I do things. And I also have the benefit of running an education research lab. I have 35 research students this summer. So actually one of the projects we're taking on in August is setting up a mock classroom to see how we can teach graphics in person with the students six plus feet apart without the instructor being able to look over their shoulders for the computer. Um, if there are things you'd be interested in having tested in such a classroom, send me an email and I will chat about it. For the online version, 
Um, my plan actually sounds very similar to what you've heard from the previous speakers, and it's what I did this spring, which is a bunch of small videos. That is a freshman level class, though. So I go one step further than even 10-minute videos. When I record videos, I try to break my lecture into like three-minute chunks that have something the student has to submit after each three-minute chunk if they're following along. So if I'm teaching drafting, we do an example, and they have to upload a picture of their example that I can like quickly check off, or maybe not even look at, but it forces them, me to know that they have looked at that. Um, so a series of smart, short trunk videos, and then open office hours. Um, but for our project part, we usually laser cut something in our graphics and design class. That has to be done. Usually I'd have the students come see that. I'm having a teaching assistant do the cutting and then mailing them all their, their completed files in the fall. Um, so in theory, I'm prepping for an in-person class, but really I'm thinking it through thinking it through as an online class because it's easier to go online to in-person for me than in-person to online. So a series of small little lectures. There will be, there will be a group project, but that will be done through Zoom, um, partially because I, I am not convinced that having students try to have a design discussion, even if a class is in-person, six feet apart wearing masks, um, I, as someone who has auditory issues, I have a hard time imagining how that would work. So I will, even for in-person classes, be encouraging students to do some of their, their group discussions virtually on Zoom so you can see the student's whole face. But other than that, it'll be definitely, even if we're on campus, no longer SolidWorks specific to the university computers, I'm going to have them doing it on laptops so that if we have to stop and switch completely remote uh, midstream, that everybody is already super comfortable doing it online. I hope that answered. Again, happy to chat more later. Yes, great. Thank you, Emory. Um, and before I ask, I think my final question, I have noticed a lot of requests for the chat. I can send a, a truncated version of the chat out via email. I won't be able to send you know, individual people's email addresses out. So if you have an email from somebody you want to email, please copy and paste that elsewhere. But I will be sharing the, um, the insights from the chat pod. And going back to the earlier question, I would also love to hear from Julian and Margot how you are planning ahead for the fall 2020 semester. I'll go. So uh, yes, um, I appreciate what we're getting to do in terms of design. Uh, so a big part of how I'm planning ahead is we are, uh, I'm teaching senior design, and so that has a lot of hands-on in it in the fall. So we are starting to work through having um, as much as possible kind of a flipped classroom mode where the things that would have been luxury are going to be online. Uh, for people to uh, use them uh, as they will, and then reconfiguring the laboratory space so that uh, students can still uh, work on the physical manipulations um, as they had in the past. So that is, in fact, going to be in person. We do senior design for real uh, clients, and so um, every team has a different project, and every team has a, a different set of outcomes. Uh, in this past semester, some of it was uh, safe and able to travel home, and some of it wasn't, and so students pivoted to uh, modeling. What we'll work very hard on this year is finding ways that students can time when they are in the room, so there's not too many people or not too much crowding, and students can um, continue to uh, communicate with each other, and this will help them actually use Scrum much better because they will have to be doing planning so that the person who is in the room, for example, can execute what the team wants them to do. Great. Cool. Thanks, Mar Mar Ooh, Margo. Margo. <laughs> uh, I'll just add, too, for I, I think to prepare for the upcoming quarters, um, definitely with the uncertainty still being there, um, I think I'm trying to strike that balance between how much you know, synchronous versus asynchronous activities do I want in the labs. Um, so I'm actually, you know, this summer I'm spending more time doing a, a little bit more pre-recorded videos and things like that, but also um, getting ready to do more, um, you know, live streaming. So I've, I've went ahead and just purchased a few more action cameras and I've already placed them in my lab uh, in certain places because um, that was really the, the big, 
I think help is having good cameras right in front of things that students should be able to read and write down data with. I just didn't have enough during uh, uh, this quarter or the last quarter I taught. So I think this fall quarter, I'm more going to be uh, trying to enhance some of the, the I, I guess, the uh, interface with the students we're dealing with and trying to make it a little bit better. Great. Thanks, Julian. So I think that about wraps it up since we only have a few minutes left. Um, so I'll say a few closing words. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much to Margot, Anne-Marie, and Julian for sharing your insights and expertise with us today. This is a fantastic webinar, and it also turned into quite the uh, networking conference in the chat pod. So that was exciting to see. Um, so please check your email. In up to two business days, we'll be sending out the recording and slides from this webinar along with an ex the uh, chat pod insights that I will be extracting. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for resources.asbe.org, which has additional resources on remote labs, capstone, and a bunch of other things. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, and thank you to my colleagues Ray and Rocio, who made sure that everything ran smoothly in Adobe Connect. And I think that's about it for us. Thanks, everyone.